You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Ring the bell. That's the right answer. Yay. We got it right. Anybody watch Jeopardy besides me? What's the answer? It's the right answer, Jesus says to the lawyer's question about in inheriting eternal life. But there must be more. Can it be so easily answered? Well, of course, there is one more teeny little question of curiosity asked by the lawyer. Who, who, sir, is my neighbor? Now, the beloved theologians, or at least my beloved theologians from Sesame Street, they have an answer for that question, right? Anybody who's got kids or grandkids or great grand, who are the people in my neighborhood? Who are the people in my neighborhood? In my neighborhood, in my neighborhood. The people that we meet when we're walking down the street. The people that we meet each and every single day. But who is my neighbor? I was saying to Tom, my husband, on, on Friday that trying to write a sermon about this Good Samaritan passage, which most church people have heard a million times, one day people were saying, oh my God, we're going through this again, one more time. It's like trying to write something new for the nativity at Christmas or something really revelatory about the resurrection at Easter. Hasn't it already been said? Well, perhaps. But let's look at the story again, because remember, today, today is a new day. Let's think about this cast of characters in this story. Remembering the words of author Robert Capon when he notes, this is, this is a parable. One of, remember, Jesus always tells his stories in parables. Parables are intended to raise more questions than they answer. If you think you're going to walk out of here having it all figured out, it's probably not going to happen. So don't be dismayed if this parable raises doubts in your mind and attacks some of the certainties with which we live. And oh, by the way, um, if you think that I have the answers, not so much is going to happen, no. The author of Luke situates this parable in the midst of the debate between a lawyer and Jesus over what is necessary to inherit eternal life. Now remember, this question's already been asked by the rich young ruler, and Jesus tells the young man that he must give up all of his possessions and follow Jesus. This Jewish lawyer would have been from the upper crust of society, would by his position have had wealth and prestige and power, the priest and the Levite in our story are part of the established hierarchy of the Jewish religion. They're sort of like, but not really, but kind of like our priests and deacons in the Episcopal Church. In the eyes of the Jews, the Samaritan was a religious heretic, a social outcast, and an ethnic enemy. Now, Samaria, the capital of Israel, was conquered in 722, and its conquerors exiled all of the nation's leaders and repopulated the area with people from all over the geographic region. Later, rivalry de developed between the Samaritan sanctuary and Mount Gerizim. Remember, we talked about this a couple weekends, weekends ago. The place where the Samaritans worshipped and the place for the Jewish, in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. 
For Luke's audience who were hearing this story, priests and Levites were respectable religious people while the Samaritans were despised. Next, we have an innkeeper about whom we know very little. Innkeepers don't get a very, very much press, do they? The guy in the, in the baby story didn't get much press either, did he? The innkeeper in Bethlehem. This guy doesn't either. We just know that he's the innkeeper who cares for the victim at the Samaritan's request. And finally, there is the unnamed person who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. The distance, that distance between Jerusalem and Jericho is about 17 miles. The route runs through the desert and rocky hill country. Historian Josephus describes it as wild and barren. And the road was a, was a notorious hideout for all of the robbers. So a robbery of a lone stranger going down this road doesn't pose a surprise to any of the people who are hearing this story. This unnamed person is robbed, stripped, and left half dead alongside of the road. Now, being stripped and left half dead makes it very, very un uncomfortable for everyone, for them to be able to determine what class, what village, what nation he might have come from. It's a complicated story in some ways. There are lots of things that don't get filled in. Sometimes when I'm contemplating a familiar piece of scripture, it's helpful to hear it in a different translation. So I'm going to, I'm going to read it to you in what's called the contemporary version, English version, the contemporary English version of the story. An expert in the law of Moses stood up and asked Jesus' this question to see what he would say. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus answered, well, what is written in the scriptures and how do you understand them? And the man replied, the scriptures say, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind. They also say, Love your neighbors as much as you love yourselves. Jesus said, you have given the right answer. If you do this, you will have eternal life. But the man wanted to show that he knew what he was talking about. So he asked Jesus, who are my neighbors? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Robbers attacked him and grabbed everything he had. They beat him up, ran off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, but when he came and saw the man, he walked on the other side. Later, a temple helper came to the same place. But when he saw the man who had been beaten up, he also went to the other side of the road. A man from Samaria then came traveling along that road. When he saw the man, he felt sorry for him and went over to him. He treated his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put him on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he could take care of him. The next morning, he gave the innkeeper two silver coins and said, please take care of the man. If you spend more than this on him, I will pay you when I return. Then Jesus asked, which of these three people was a real neighbor to the man who was beaten by the robbers? The expert in the law of Moses answered, the one who showed pity. And Jesus said, go and do the same. 
Jesus' question, which one of these three people was a real neighbor to the man who was beaten up by robbers? The answer, of course, was the one who showed pity or mercy or compassion. But the lawyer would never believe that his, ne- that his neighbor could be the outcast Samaritan who would choose to respond to the person in the ditch. Who This person who's been robbed, by the way, is now himself an outcast simply because of what the robbers have done to him. Even if the half-dead man were Jewish, he would now be an outcast because he had been left naked and half-dead. For the Samaritan to care for the victim required him to cross the social, political, and religious street, both figuratively and literally. The Samaritan chose to cross the boundaries of wealth and prestige and power to meet the needs of the man lying on the side of the road. I wonder about this. I wonder when are the times when I need to cross over to show compassion and mercy and love in the name of Christ. When are those times when our neighbor turns out to be those folks we least expect? Or when we, you and I, are the person in need awaiting someone's mercy and the person who comes is the most remarkable and unusual and unexpected. I was listening to um, Presiding Bishop Michael Curry's sermon at the opening Eucharist of General Convention, which um, is going to be wrapping up tomorrow. And oh, by the way, that, at that initial uh, opening convention on Thursday, Friday, um, Bishop Curry was the preacher, but uh, our Bishop Diana Akiyama was the officiant, was a celebrant for the service, which was really awesome. But anyway, I commend, the, I commend his, his sermon to you. It, it's, it's very thought-provoking. He was talking about Jesus giving the new commandment. You remember in the, on Monday, Thursday, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The same way that God loves you, love each other with that same love. For by this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Uh, just as an aside, he's not talking about just us and here, like, you know. And we're not just loving us. We're loving everybody. Everybody. That's hard. That's hard. Walking the way of unselfish... Sac- this is Bishop Curry's words. Walking the way of unselfish, sacrificial love, as Jesus taught us, closes the gap <laughs> from getting from there to over there. Following the way of this Jesus until his footprints and our footprints become indistinguishable. He begins to close the gap. I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. It is this love of which Bishop Curry speaks, that makes reaching out to our neighbors possible. It's not us. It's Jesus through us. It's not always easy. Most of the time, it's pretty challenging. A task that may seem as though it is beyond our reach. In this Jesus movement, that Bishop Curry talks about. The Jesus movement love fuels the answer to our baptismal question, will you, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Let me read that to you again. I know you know it by heart. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? What's your answer? 
and say it again. All right. Yeah, yeah, I, we will. It's that Jesus love within us that makes it possible to bridge the gap between me and my neighbor. Tom was telling me um, a story about a group of men in which he was uh, in a Bible study, and they were, it was, uh, these guys had been meeting together like four or five years, and, and um, so they were pretty, they're pretty good about being straight with one another. And they got to, they were using the scriptures, the weekly scriptures as their study, and they got to the story of the Good Samaritan, and they were talking about who were their neighbors. Not the person that just lives right next door to me, but neighbors generically. And one of the men began to tell a story about his employment. And the, I, I won't give you the descriptive words that he was using, but um, the, his, um, his, the struggle with his relationship and his, and his boss, to the point that the, the man was actually contemplating leaving his job because he was having so much trouble with his boss. When one of the men in the group suggested that maybe his boss was his neighbor. The man's face just fell. It was like, oh my God. Really, oh my God. The unexpected and reversal of expectations is part of what this parable is all about. God's love knows no boundaries, no constraints. God's love knows no boundaries. It's not bound by walls. The, constraint, the constraints on God's love are things that we put around it. This parable may leave us, or it does me, with an uneasy conscience. How is it that in the name of Jesus' love, I will respond to my neighbor? What is it that makes me go to the other side? To not bridge that gap. What makes me avoid some type of people Those are the questions I have to face. I face within myself all the time. We live in a time in which polarization is commonplace. Everywhere we turn, in social media, news commentators, and just our general conversations. <laughs> this isn't part of the script, but it just occurred to me. I was standing in the grocery line. I was standing in the grocery line after, after the Supreme Court's ruling on Roe versus Wade. And there were some people in front of me. And they were talking. And they said, it's about time. How do I bridge? How do I bridge that neighborly gap? In that gap, in that polarity, stands my neighbor. I don't know about you, but it does for me. A person created in God's image. <laughs> God Help me to see beyond our differences of opinion and find our common humanity. Jesus, love, help me bridge that gap. Help us to be people of holy listening. Help us to be people of holy compassion and mercy. I pray that I can identify those blocks in myself that cause me to ignore or belittle other people's needs. Holy God, give us the love we need to share and then let us share it to bridge the gap. 
in a, in a moment after the, at the conclusion of the service, um, thank you, Bruce, for this. We're going to be singing um, a hymn entitled, Lord, Whose Love Through Humble Service. As I close, I want this to be our prayer. This is the final verse of that hymn. Called by worship to do your service, forth in your dear name we go to the child, the youth, the aged, love in living deeds to show. Hope and health, goodwill and comfort, counsel, aid and peace we give that your servants, Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Amen. <laughs>